I want to first of all thank everybody for coming out today. Uh, today is a very, very special day in the history of the United States. Today is a, de a day that we give reverence and celebrate some of our heroes and sheroes, those people who fought for our country, those people who sacrificed for our personal freedoms and our liberties. And I just want to say uh, happy Veterans Day to all those who served and volunteered to fight for our country, those who are abroad and are still fighting for our country today. It's those people that put their lives on the line each and every day that we should never ever forget, not just in times of Veterans Day, uh, when we're celebrating the official holiday, but each and every day of the year, because those men and women, they make tremendous sacrifices. They take away from their families to protect our freedoms. And so I just want to say thank you for all of the veterans that serve our country. We're here today uh, to have a press conference to talk about uh, some of the things that transpired within uh, my criminal trial in Montgomery County, Texas. I have uh, some brief statements and then there, there are some others that are gonna follow behind me to make some remarks. Uh, before I say anything, I really wanna say that I am very thankful to God that he gave me the strength and the faith to endure the tremendous challenge, all the obstacles, the trials, the tribulations, and the persecutions that I faced. It was a very, very difficult and stressful time for, for me and my family. But because of my faith in God, I had the strength and the endurance to continue to fight and to continue to press forward in spite of all of the naysayers that told me that I could not have a fair trial in Montgomery County, Texas. That told me that I should take a plea deal that was offered to me. I rejected the plea deal. I rejected the offer because at all times, I have maintained my innocence. It's my fundamental belief that anybody who is accused of a crime that they have not committed should never ever be forced or have to feel like they have right. to plead guilty right. to a crime that they did not commit. Right, the unfortunate thing about our criminal justice system is that sometimes the deck is stacked against you before you even start. That's right. You know, in 2008, we experienced history in the United States of America when President Barack Obama was sworn in as president of the United States of America, of America the first person of color. When a lot of people that I talked to in my own family, my great-great-grandmother, my great-grandmother, never thought she would ever see the day that we would have a black president of the United States of America. And so there was a great time of rejoice and happiness to celebrate that historic feat. I too was very proud. And some had said that we had arrived. We had arrived to a post-racial society where we really didn't have the kind of pervasive racial discrimination that has existed in our past because we elected a black president. That feeling was kind of short-lived. It didn't last a whole long time because once the Tea Party and there were so many other organizations that came out, they started to voice a lot of hate, not as it, at his policies, but that he wasn't from this country. He wasn't, he wasn't from here. He never should have been elected in the first place. They challenged his birth certificate. They challenged everything about him. He was a socialist, he was a communist, all kind of things to demonize him because of the color of his skin. And it's very unfortunate that in 2014, people still believe that those things are pervasive. It's more covert. It's not too often that you find a cross burning in the open yard but discrimination, it still takes place. Right. It's that ugly word that you don't really want to talk about because if you do, you're accused of playing the race card. But the facts are the facts. I believe in speaking truth to power, regardless of what it is. I want to call an ace a ace and a spade a spade. Many who know me know that in my career as a past municipal judge for the city of Houston, 
as, an, as a, uh, a former associate municipal judge for the city of Houston and as past president of the Missouri City NAACP, past president of the Houston Lawyers Association. I've never in my life played the race card. And in my two terms in office as state representative, I've never ever made my race an issue. Not until this trial. This case was brought by the district attorney in Montgomery County, Texas. Montgomery County, Texas is factually one of the most conservative counties in the state of Texas and the entire United States of America. The population of Montgomery County, Texas is about 85% Anglo. There are less than 4% African Americans that reside in Montgomery County, Texas. Now, a lot of people who are uh, maybe in this audience or maybe listening to this press conference can remember some of the history and pervasive discrimination that has taken place in Montgomery County, Texas. We don't have to talk about all of it, but a lot of us are familiar with the most famous case where Clarence Bradley, a man who was innocent, that was accused of rape in the, in the death and murder of a, a Conroe High School female, white Anglo female student. He was a innocent man that was on death row that was convicted based on circumstantial evidence and exculpatory evidence that was not ever presented to his counsel to have him the opportunity to have a fair defense. He was convicted by an all-white jury. He was on death row and only until the Court of Appeals ultimately reversed it He's a free man today. He was exonerated because witnesses came forth and said, I tried to tell her he wasn't the one who committed this crime, but they didn't want to hear it. Right. And so there is some history. And so I'm not here to talk about innuendo. I'm not here to make up anything, put any spin on anything, but really just speak truth to power. You know, Dr. Martin Luther King said, said very eloquently a long time ago that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And what I experienced from my own personal experience, not from what someone else did, from my own personal experience, I can tell you that I experienced some injustices in Montgomery County. And unfortunately, because the legal proceedings will probably continue to go because the judge declared a mistrial and she set a new trial date. I can't get into the specifics of all of the details, but I can tell you some of the things that were surrounding why I'm, I'm making the statement that I'm making. The day after we started the, the trial, which would have been election day, this sign right here was planted in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, the entrance of the courthouse. It was a voting place. And this sign, it speaks for itself. It says, reject race baiters and poverty pimps. Reject race baiters and poverty pimps. Obama, Holder, Jackson, and Sharpton. Now, I've been many polling places in my life before I was a candidate and, and since the time I've been in office, and I've never seen a sign like this at any polling place. This is, I found this to be very offensive, very offensive. First of all, none of these people were on the ballot, okay? So, so they weren't rejecting any of them. Who were they rejected? What was this speaking to? This, to me, spoke volumes of some of the mindset, some of the, the, the unfortunate, the, 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 the prejudice and stereotypes and the racism that is inherent in some places. This to me is despicable. This to me is unacceptable in any community, in any community. And I had to see this each and every day that I went to enter the courthouse until one of my good friends, who is also a former police officer and an attorney, Michael Harris, who is here, asked the bailiff if he could take the sign away. The election was over and he took this sign down. This sign I saw every day up until Thursday. And I was highly offended by this sign. And so what I'm what I'm here to say is that I felt it was incumbent upon me as a state representative, someone who 
has a platform, someone who has a, 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 to me, a civic duty to speak out. My faith teaches me, and one of the convictions that I live by is found in Proverbs 31, 8 and 9. And it says, speak out for the one who cannot speak, for the rights of those who are doomed. Speak out, judge fairly, and defend the rights of oppressed and needy people. What I'm here today is to say that this is not about Ron Reynolds. This is more about society in general and the inherent discrimination that happens sometimes, not all the times, but sometimes in the criminal justice system, you're guilty until proven innocent. That's right. Our Constitution, which I abide by as, an, as a, 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 an attorney and as a state representative, I swore to uphold the Constitution. Our United States Constitution and our Texas Constitution provides that all men should be treated equally, equally and that everyone should be guaranteed life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But unfortunately, in our criminal justice system, when you're an African American, you don't always get the benefit of the doubt. Now, I had the benefit of high-powered attorneys, and one of them here is here, Vivian King. I had a, another great local attorney, Steve Jackson. I was able, because I've been a successful at attorney, I was able to spend over six figures defending myself from these unfortunate charges that were brought against me. But what about the average citizen? What about the average person of color who doesn't have the financial means, who is not an elected official? What about them? That's what this press conference is about. It's about giving voice, speaking truth to power, and bringing to light something wrong with our criminal justice system where if you're an African-American, you're a target. You are a target. I'm not telling you what I think or what I hear. I'm telling you what I know and what I personally experienced from my situation and my trial. And so my concern is that if it happened to me, and I am a state representative, and I have these resources to defend myself and hire the best attorneys, hire the best experts, hire private investigators, these other young men, and not necessarily young men, but African-American men, sometimes they don't stand a chance. Because what happens in the criminal justice system is even if you're innocent, sometimes you're pressured to take a plea bargain that will make you get a conviction on your record that is hard to overcome. And so just like in this case, they offered me a plea bargain where if I would resign my seat, that they would give me a plea bargain. In other words, I wouldn't be faced with a felony conviction. A felony conviction for barratry, which is, you know, some commonly known as ambulance chasing, carries a, a penalty of two to 10 years in prison. Two to 10 years in prison. So I was facing two to 10 years in prison for a crime I didn't commit. Even my lawyer said, Ron, we know you're innocent. We believe you're innocent. The evidence supports you, but you're in a very conservative place. We don't know what's going to happen. When you get these 12 people, they can convict you. Sometimes not based on the evidence, but because of who you are. Mm -hmm. And so that was a concern that my lawyers gave me. I was very pressured by my colleagues, by my counsel, by my family. I'm a, I'm a proud husband of three, and, a, and, a, and, and I did not want to lose my children. But for my faith, and my strong belief that God was saying, this is bigger than you, Ron Reynolds. Don't turn back. Stick with your conviction. I won't let you down. I would have took that plea. I would have resigned from office and I wouldn't be representing the constituents that stand behind me. You see, these people who elected me, they're the ones that determine who's gonna serve as state representative of House District 27. It's not the district attorney's office to make that decision. It's not for me to make that decision. It's for the voters. The voters are the people who are the boss. They're the, the ones who make that decision. And they voted for me and reelected me to a third term with nearly 70% of the vote. And so I stand here today very confidently because I have the support of my constituents. I have the support of my family. And I have a firm belief that this is for me to speak out for those other brothers out there 
who are facing the criminal justice system to give them a voice. And my, you, as you can hear my words, my goal is gonna be when I go back to Austin, because I'm going back to Austin, I'm gonna continue to fight to make sure that there's a voice for those who don't have a voice. I'm going to fight for legislation to make sure that this doesn't continue to happen to other brothers. We saw last session there were over 20 African American men who had been in prison, some for 30, 40 years, and they were finally exonerated for crimes that they never committed. And so my thing is there are probably hundreds of thousands of those who are locked up to this day or took a plea bargain for something they didn't do. And this is for them. You know what? It doesn't even matter if it's one. One, if it's one single person, that's one single person too many. And so my message today is this. It is time to stand up. It is time to speak out. It is time to fight. It is time to move forward. And what can we do as citizens? Well, one of the things that we can do is that we can exercise our right as a citizen to make sure that you serve on those juries. Now, I'm going to keep it real. A lot of times, African Americans get a jury summons and they can think of every excuse not to go and serve on that jury. Well, little did they know that their voice needs to be heard. We need to have a jury of our peers. We need to make sure that there's diversity in our jurors, just like we need to make sure there's diversity in our courts, in our Congress, in our state representatives, in our elected officials in our schools, in our school boards, everywhere, there should be diversity. And so we should make sure that we serve on juries. We should make sure that we don't try to shirk our civic responsibility. We should make sure that we don't try to think of every excuse to get kicked off the jury when we're summoned to go to the jury. We should make sure that we try to get to serve on grand juries to, to be able to be that, 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 that barrier to make sure that, they, that we don't get frivolous claims. It's once been said that a, 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 a DA can indict a ham sandwich. It's easy to get an indictment. Anybody can, be, can get an indictment. But for the grace of God, the next time it could be you or your son or your brother or your father or your cousin. So the, the point of it is, is that it's bigger than us. Each of us has a responsibility. To whom much is given, much is required. And what I'm saying is that against the vice of my lawyers, I'm speaking out. I know I'm gonna be a target. They're gonna to continue to come after me. And I could, all I gotta do is just shut up and be quiet. I had a misdemeanor. I could have just said, you know what? I'm, I'm through, this is fine. I didn't get it, I, I got off on a felony. I'm gonna go back to Austin. I'm gonna go back to doing what I'm doing. But I said, no, 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 no. This is much bigger than Ron Reynolds. I have a message and I want that message to reach the masses. And in closing, I just wanna say, that elections matter, elections matter. And the reason why elections matter is because every district attorney in the state of Texas is elected. They're elected by the citizens of their community and their county. It is incumbent upon us that we don't just elect people during presidential elections where voter turnout is huge. This last local election in Texas that we just had this midterm, Texas had the lowest voter turnout of any state in the United States of America. That's a shame. Mm. Now, here's the reason why it's a shame. Because those same people that are gonna be complaining about what's wrong with our community, what's wrong with our society, those people that have, didn't vote, to me, they shouldn't even be complaining. You lose the right to complain when you don't exercise your right to vote because your vote is your voice. When you don't vote, you're letting someone else speak for you. And when people don't elect people that represent their interests, they get people that don't care about their interests. That's why you get voter ID laws. That's why you get racially gerrymandered districts that the court said voter ID, it was, the, it was a modern day poll tax. That's the reason why elections matter. You have to make sure that you elect judges. In Texas, we're one of the few states where judges are elected based upon partisanship. That means if judges are elected based on they're either Democrat or Republican. And it's my statement to everybody that can hear my voice, make sure you vote, vote your conscience, vote for people that are gonna speak for your values. And so I just wanna say thank you for listening to me. Thank you for coming out. I wanna bring up uh, my attorney and a few other people to make some brief remarks. And I just wanna say, God bless 
the uh, everybody here, and God bless the veterans, and God bless the United States of, of America. And I want to bring Vivian King, my attorney, up here to talk a little bit about the criminal proceeding that just happened. Vivian King, a great, a great defense attorney. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. As Ron said, I am his lawyer. My name is Vivian King. And I did advise against him giving a press conference because we stand alone in the criminal courthouse. DA's, a DA's oath is not to convict, but to see that justice is done. But what we see in the courthouse is not always justice. We see that on conservative blogs, they talk about plea bargains. They talk about what Ron has done and what he has not done. That's not fair to him. The Montgomery County District Attorney's Office wants him to resign in Harris, I mean, in McFort Bend County as state rep. Why? What does that have to do with a crime if a crime was committed? What does that have to do with it? You don't have to be a lawyer to be a state representative. So that is up to the voters of Fort Bend County to decide who represents them. So I do believe that in many ways Montgomery County has overstepped their boundaries. They want him to give up his law license. Well, we have the Texas board that, can, that governs us. They tell us what we can and cannot do. We have disciplinary rules. Let them deal with disciplinary rules. Let the district attorney's office deal with what they believe is a crime and not a crime. Why do the conservatives know more about his case than we do? We think that's wrong. We're also concerned, I'm concerned and afraid for the African-American juror who stood up against that system. She lives in Montgomery County. She's been isolated and she was brought in the courtroom in front of everybody, in front of the other 12 jurors because there was one alternate who were all Anglo or Anglo-Hispanic and she was, they, everyone knows what happened. What is going to happen to her for standing alone? I, I promise you, when we stand in that courthouse, we stand alone. We stand alone because voters don't come out, because we are not a part of the decision-making process that's down at that courthouse. And it's difficult. I think Ron Reynolds was surprised at how judges react and how jurors react and how bailiffs react and how court staff react to people, how they treated him. So he knows if he was treated disrespectfully, how the everyday person is treated. And I think the reason why he wants to speak out against my advice is that he understands and wants to speak for that little person because he watched a lot of black men in shackles, shackles on their feet and shackles on their hands. He watched when the jury was deliberating five or six policemen walk in the courtroom ready to shackle him. But, and I think his friends and supporters who were there in that courthouse saw it. Other lawyers who practice civil law saw it. And they realized how we stand alone. They realized how even our Anglo lawyers who believe in us and believe in Ron get scared because they have to live in that community. They get scared, they're silenced. There are many times I had to take the lead on a lot of racially charged issues. Ron was referred to the N-word. People heard it. Anglo lawyers heard it. They brought it forward. I mean, there were a lot of things that were going on behind the scenes. And understand this, our forefathers fought for the right for us to be on juries. There's a famous United States Supreme Court, Batson versus Kentucky. That black juror, she fought to stay on that jury. The judge tried to get her off of that jury and replace her with the alternate that was a white male. She said, no. I can make a decision on punishment. Don't take me off. She has an equal protection right to be there. And she fought for that. And the reason why a mistrial was granted is because we did not want the judge to do that. The lady was questioned. She said she, even though there was outside influence, she could make a decision on punishment. And the judge decided that she should be disqualified. Why? She said the right thing. And what white America doesn't understand is that black people and black jurors are fair to everybody. We're not partisan. Right. If there's a white defendant, black people are going to see that that could be them sitting in that seat. And they're going to be fair, just as fair as to the black defendant, as to the white defendant, as to the Hispanic defendant. We understand racism. We understand being singled out. And so we take our oath very seriously. 
We take the Constitution very seriously, and we believe in it, and we think it's running on autopilot. We don't realize that we've got to bring life to that document, and we've got to be down there in, in, in fighting that battle in the courtroom to make sure that the punishments fit the crime, to make sure that people are found not guilty if they're not, to make sure it's their conscience, because the courtroom doesn't belong to the Republicans. The courtroom doesn't belong to the Democrats. The courtroom belongs to us. Sure. And that's why the Constitution was written for 12 people to decide, because otherwise the government, Goliath, would grab anybody that they don't like and incarcerate them, and you can't get out. And so our forefathers were smart, and it's what's saving us today is that you get 12 people in your community, in your county, that have to say unanimously that, yes, we agree with Goliath. Yes, we agree with the government. Yes, we agree with the deep pockets. And we have to protect that right, and we have to protect that black juror. Because I think that she was singled out in the courtroom, and I feel for her. I'm going to find her. So I can apologize to her <clears throat> for the way she was treated and ask that she continue to do her civic duty. And with that, I will step down. Thank you. Next, next I would like to bring up uh, Pastor Deaver, who is uh, a, a uh, Fort Bend pastor and, and uh, former pastor, president of the Fort Bend Pastors Association. Pastor Deaver, come up here and say some words. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Representative Mills. I think it's incumbent upon all of us to stand strong at times like these. Uh, we are all products of our uh, community. We uh, fervently believe that uh, Ron Reynolds uh, is innocent of these uh, charges. Uh, we uh, pray and ask that God would uh, be with him at this time, that would lead him and to uh, be uh, his protector. Uh, all of us are out here because that, that we support him in, in what he does. Uh, he has always been a champion for our community. As long as I have known him, I've known him to be an ethical, moral, and upright uh, uh, a man. And so we, we just plead with uh, everyone that's associated with this that we continue to look at him for what he is, not for what people are trying to paint him to be. Uh, I think if we do that, we'll, we would all understand that uh, he's innocent of these charges, and we can send him home to his wife and his family. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Pastor Amen. Amen. Uh, next, I want to bring up uh, either Brother Derek Muhammad or Brother Omar, uh, and then we'll be followed by uh, Brother Quano X to close us out. Oh, well, we get Doc Holliday, the president of the Missouri City NAACP, next. Doc, why don't you come up? Thank you, Doc. Thanks, everyone. I brought with me an NAACP publication, The Crisis. The Crisis. Well, I can tell that for sure, me, please. Sure, absolutely. In this edition of The Crisis, it talks about the headlines are under the gun. Black people have been human targets for far too long. And, and what do I mean by human targets? I mean Adrian Peterson, Ray Rice, President Obama, and Ron Reynolds. You know, we look at these gentlemen and we ask, why are they under targets so often and so much when we have other people that do serious crimes, such as Mr. Christian McFadden, an ex Santa Clara County, California sheriff who killed four kids. We had Timothy Jones in South Carolina. He killed five kids. We had Donald Spirit. He killed his daughter and six kids. And a Houston area killing of two adults and four kids. Adrian Peterson in the court system in, in Montgomery County, by the way. Thank, thank you, Doc. Uh, let me see, is, is uh, Brother Omar or if not, Derek Muhammad. In the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful, I bear witness to the oneness of God. And we thank him for giving us the strength and the presence of mind to be here today with our brother Ron Reynolds. As was stated by our dear pastor, I want to say that we stand 110% behind state representative Ron Reynolds. I want to say that we as a community believe that he is an innocent man. And if he has the courage to stand before these cameras, even against the sound professional advice of his attorneys, then I believe that every black person in Harris County, Montgomery County, and any other county 
We need to have the courage to stand behind our brother who has decided to take a stand for us all today. Yes. You know, there comes a time in a man's life where he just has to swing the axe of truth at the tree of circumstance and let the chips fall where they may. This is a time such as that. So it's happening to run right now. You never know who's going to be tomorrow. And if this brother who is well-polished, well-spoken, well-educated, he's climbed the ladder of success through his honest and hard work. If this can happen to him, then know that this can happen to any one of us. So I leave you with the words of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. He said these words, brothers and sisters. He said that no single individual can ever rise above the condition of his or her people. So, matter, so no matter how much success you think that you have attained, at the end of the day, you're no better than the young brother that you pass by every day standing at the bus stop with nowhere to go. Yeah. So today I want to make a call for unity, particularly those of us who are in the political arena. You know, many of us consider ourselves enemies, when at the end of the day we have a common enemy. So let this be the day that we put down our swords and stop swinging them at one another and stand behind our dear brother Ron Reynolds as he has stood today for us all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, next I want to bring up Minister Quan L. X. You know, I really wasn't going to really say too much <clears throat> because I kind of felt that everything that needed to be said has already been said. But in all honesty, you're all right, Pastor. But in all honesty, um, we have to be willing to tell the truth. And to be honest, we are going through this because a lot of us, you're just scared. It's the truth, you're scared. Let's tell it like it is, man. We don't have to ask why there's an attack on black men. It's a crisis because we're black men. Montgomery County has a documented history, a long documented history of racism and bigotry. That's, right. that's nothing new. Right. A sign like that is acceptable because that's the mindset that is pervasive to, among many who live and reside in Montgomery County. They want you to resign, brother, because now Democrats and Republicans in Texas are using the criminal justice system to punish each other, like Tom DeLay like Governor Perry, they're now going after each other using the criminal justice system as a political weapon. That's right. But that's not really what this is about. That's right. Yeah, you spent a lot of money, but in the eyes of the white folks on that jury, man, you just another nigga criminal with some money right. who got it illegally. That's what they're thinking. That's why the two could go in the bathroom, Vivian, the two jurors. And one white lawyer stood up and told them and the judge what she heard in the bathroom. Right. Referred to this man as a nigger in the bathroom, but the judge didn't feel that was sufficient for a mistrial. Mm. How could two jurors be told to have used the N-word toward this man, who they're sitting in deliberation of this man's life, call him a nigger, and that's not sufficient for a mistrial? Because that's Montgomery County. Right. We got to be willing to stand straight up and strong and say we're not going to allow this brother to go down by himself without a fight in Montgomery County. They took him to Montgomery County for a reason. Because they knew you wouldn't have no black folk on your jury. And they knew they would give you one that they can frighten and intimidate and scare to death. So they gave you a sister, but they did not know that black women have been some of the strongest that we've ever had in black community. So that sister stood without fear and told the judge in front of all them white jurors, yeah, this is what happened. Yeah, this is what took place. But the racist judge, he still was willing to disqualify her and replace her with a white man who would think like the others. Brother, ain't no fair trial in Montgomery County for a black man down there today. And the only way you're going to get one is if all of us who are standing here, you're willing to go to Montgomery County. If you're not willing to go with hell, what good are you going to be for this brother and the other brother? You got to go down there and fill the courtroom yes, sir. and let them know he ain't by himself. What you're doing to him, you're doing to all of us. That's right. Then maybe some of them will think twice. Yeah. 
But brother, y'all got to be willing to stand without That's fear, it. man. That's why them young brothers and sisters in Ferguson, Missouri, raised so much hell. Because the mainstream elected ones and benefited ones couldn't quiet them down. Because they so disconnected from them. So they rose up on their own. That's what's happening among all of us now, man. That's right. That's right. That's right. So I'm through. But Montgomery County is what it is. So when he go, all right. I'm down. I'm going with you. Yeah. 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 When he go. We need you. I'm lonely. We all got to come, man. Yeah. Yeah. And so those who like signs like this, come on and bring your signs. Because all of us are not scared. So if you want to intimidate jurors with this, poor black woman juror, she got to walk in the courthouse and see this every day. And you got to ask a bailiff, can you remove this? The post sister got to look at this every day and render a just verdict. Man, this has to stop. So we do what we got to do. But I say let's get on to Montgomery County. Yes. Because it's time for a showdown anyway, man. Yeah. <laughs> so let's get going. Let's go. All of us may not fight the same, but we all got to fight. Say it. Say it. Wow. After that, I want to make sure that we, we close out in prayer. And I want to ask that uh, uh, Pastor Nash, if you would uh, please close us out with a, with a prayer and, and uh, some words of encouragement as, just to kind of close this press conference out. Come on up here. One of the things I want to say is that Montgomery County, here we come. Hey, say it, say it, Pastor Nash. We're on our way. Another attempt to tear down a black leader. We're tired of it. We're not going to stand for it. We're going to stand together with this man. When I look at this man, I see integrity, good character, and great credibility. A family man. A man who hear any scandal. We are not going to let you tear this man down with our support. Amen. We're coming to Montgomery County. Yeah. Yeah. We going? Yeah. yeah. All right then. Let us close out. Oh God, our Father, thank you for this opportunity to stand again before you, standing with this young man that you place so much emphasis on him that you place your spirit within him. We thank you now. Thank you for all the support. Yes, it's showing here today. Thank you, Father. Let it not just be for this day for yes, sure. Yes. But we're going to the end. Whatever it takes for to get there, we're yes, going to be Father. there. Thank you, Father. We're going to stand with this young man on this day. And not only this day, however long it takes, we're going to be there with him. We pray now you will bless all of us, our homes, our families, individuals, as well as collective. You have the power and the resources. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank, thank you. And thank everybody for coming out. I do appreciate it.